Hey friends, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 17. If you're not in a place where you have access to a traditional Bible, you can open up the version, or it's also called the Bible app and all the notes and scriptures. Those have already been uploaded for you. Of course, we'll also put the scriptures right there on your screen. Wherever it is that you're watching us from, I love you and I'm so grateful that you're part of our family. I wonder, have you started singing the songs yet? You know, the Christmas carols. I started singing them weeks ago and it started with, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I don't know, but for whatever reason, it always starts with it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And then usually uh, I slide into singing this Christmas, but only the Donny Hathaway version because every other version kind of feels like a counterfeit, kind of feels like a bad copy to me. The other day, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but I just couldn't stop singing Jingle Bell Rock. Well, one of my favorites though, one of my all time jams is Joy to the World. And it's not so much the melody that I like, it's the message that I love. Because in my mind, it's the essence and the meaning of Christmas. In fact, when you read Luke chapter two, verse eight through 10, it says, and there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord, it appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord, it shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel, he said to them, don't be afraid, I bring you good news and it'll cause you great joy and great joy for all the people. I mean, it's not only the essence of Christmas, it's the essence of God. Joy, it shows up second on the list of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's the second characteristic to bloom as the Spirit's fruit blossoms in our lives. We serve the God of great joy. In writing the 16th Psalm, the author said, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I wonder, is it possible to be exposed to God and still live your life without joy? Zephaniah said, the Lord your God, he's with you. He's a hero who saves you. He happily rejoices over you. He renews you with his love and he celebrates over you with shouts of joy. Man, I love that verse. And in the Hebrew, the word celebrates actually means to spin around and to rejoice. I mean, come on, man, that is so dope that God, he celebrates over you with great joy. It's kind of like when I see my kids and I can be in the worst mood, but when they're excited to see me, when they run up to me, even as teenagers, and they call me daddy, y'all, it's a wrap. It brings me joy. So can I say to you, it's time? I mean, it's time, isn't it? Isn't it time we just lived in joy? Ecclesiastes says, to everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what's planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to laugh. I wanna talk about that today in a message we're calling Laugh Often. Let's pray. God, we love you, we're grateful to you. Thank you that you are the God of joy. God, I pray that you would well up within us this joy unspeakable and filled with glory. I pray for my friends who are watching this right now that no matter what they're going through, they will be exposed to and they will absorb the spirit of joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Joy, what is joy? I mean, does it mean I'm happy all the time? Do I walk around singing Pharrell Williams, quoting Buddy the Elf, smiling's my favorite? No, because I'd propose to you that happiness and joy are two different things. My, my wife, Pastor Sunny, she does this really great teaching on happiness versus joy. And in that, she teaches that something has to happen to you to make you happy. A new house, a new car, a new job, a new love, something happened. And so now because of that something, you're happy. Happiness is external, but joy, joy is internal. It's a matter of the heart. The Proverbs tells us, guard our hearts above all else because it determines the course of our lives. Guard our hearts above all else because it determines the course of our lives. Guard your heart. 
guard your joy. Don't let anyone steal your joy. Guard your heart because the condition of your heart determines the quality of your life. The world, it wants to steal your joy. It wants to steal your heart. And it's so subtle. Buy this, do that, go here. You need this thing. If you could just get that guy, if you could just get that girl. Second Timothy talks about it. It says, but mark this. Like, that's really good. Like, pay attention. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the end days. People, they're going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, and not lovers of the good. It's saying in the last days, people will give up their hearts. They'll give up their joy. So let me give you, just so you can be on guard, let me give you four heart conditions that'll rob you of your joy. And here's the first, being ungrateful. Like becoming more focused on what you don't have than on what you do have. Becoming more focused on what you want than on what you have. It's the picture of kids at Christmas. (laughs) Have you ever had your kids disappointed by what they didn't get instead of being excited about what they did get? I mean, we do that all the time. We do the same thing when, when rather than just wanting a new car or a different house, we become dissatisfied with our current car or our current house. When rather than aspiring to a new job or striving for a promotion, we become disgruntled with our current job or our current position. Guys, no matter how you define that, you're being ungrateful. And the only way to beat ungratefulness is by recognizing we are blessed. The book of Ephesians, it says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Jesus. Here's the second condition that robs us of our joy, being unholy. Sin robs us of joy. I mean, it may feel good in the moment, but sin plagues us with feelings of guilt and shame. Some of you are carrying that around right now. You're carrying around unrepentant sin and it's robbing you of your joy. And the only way that we beat sin and shame is through repentance. The Apostle John, he said, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's just and he will forgive us of those sins and he will purify us from all of our unrighteousness. I mean, have you ever admitted something? Doesn't that feel so good? It's because we were designed that way. The Bible says that confession is good for the soul. So being unholy robs us of our joy. Here's the third condition that robs us of our joy is being unloving. This starts when we become hard-hearted toward people, when when we close people out, when we shut people off, when we categorize people because of how they look, where they're from, what they believe, how they vote, how they identify. We become hard-hearted toward people when we start viewing others as objects rather than people, when we lose our compassion. And you know, the more hard-hearted we are, the more miserable our life becomes. But the Proverbs tells us a tender-hearted person lives a blessed life while a hard-hearted person lives a hard life. The way we beat a hard heart is by seeing the humanity in others. Okay, here's the fourth condition that robs us of our joy, is being unforgiving. Unforgiveness is one of the most destructive forces our hearts will ever endure. It completely destroys the quality of our lives and it robs us of our joy. And there's only one way to beat unforgiveness, by releasing people from their debt because releasing them from their debt releases you from your pain. But to do that, you have to change your perspective. Like, this isn't us versus them. We have to recognize the source. The book of Ephesians tells us that our struggles, they're not against flesh and blood. They're against the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And those spiritual forces are trying to rob us of our joy, especially during this season. I mean, it's the most wonderful time of the year. And it is because Christmas is a season of hope. It's a season of forgiveness. And that forgiveness is represented in the gift, Jesus 
When you get the gift deep inside you, unforgiveness, it, it can't even be an option because as 1 John says, you're from God. So you've overcome them because the one who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. There's joy in the act of forgiveness. And as the prophet Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I know I get it. Trust me. I understand. It's not easy. But James tells us to consider it pure joy when trouble comes. So change your perspective or as we tell our kids, fix your face because the Proverbs tells us a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit, that saps a person's strength. It's where we get to saying laughter is good medicine. So I've decided I've made a conscious choice to laugh at my pain. And can I tell you, I've had plenty of pain. I've had more than my fair share. So from the lessons I've learned from that difficult decision, let me leave you with four ways to laugh often. Here's the first, make the choice every day. This is a choice. We have to consciously decide, today I'm going to have joy. I'm not going to let life drag me down. I'm not going to let my job, my coworkers, my gossipy girlfriends, the news, the economy, the virus drag me down. I'm going to take the words of Hebrews 12 to heart. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. So I'm gonna surround myself with positive people so I can live out the words of the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Here's a second way to laugh often is to develop a deep appreciation for life. First Thessalonians says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Jesus. Friends, can we please stop whining? Can we please stop complaining? Can we please just trust God? Romans 8 says, we're confident that God is able to orchestrate everything to work towards something good and beautiful when we love him and accept his invitation to live according to his plan. And some of us could benefit from developing a deeper appreciation for life. It's a blessing. It's a gift. Here's the third way to laugh often is find something positive in everything. My pastor used to say, your perception is your reality. If you perceive things to be negative, things are gonna be negative. But if you perceive things to be positive, they'll generally end up positive. I mean, I sometimes joke about being a pessimist, but deep down, I hate it. I wish that I could be more like my wife, like Pastor Sonny. It, with her, the glass is always half full, maybe a little more. With her, things are gonna work out. Things are gonna be great, and it's not easy, but it is simple. The formula is found in the book of Philippians. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, think about those things. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Guys, we all have something positive. We all have something praiseworthy. We just have to find it and focus on it. Here's the fourth way to laugh often, is turn everything over to God. Philippians 4 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus. Peace, it's what we're all looking for. You do know God's got you, right? He said he'd never leave you, that he's never gonna forsake you. He's not blind to your struggles. His eyes aren't closed. He sees what's happening. And he looks at your situation and he says, and I quote, why are you tripping? Can you just hand it off? Can you just hand it over? Could you just cast all your anxieties on him? Like he cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you more than you care for yourself. So again, can you just hand it off? Can you please just hand it over? I mean, what if you just tried it? I know it's hard, but what if like just till the end of the year, you tried it and if it doesn't work, 
you can go back to what's not working right now. Because if we're honest, what we've been doing hasn't been working. So just until the end of the year, why don't you try handing everything over to God? I wonder, would you start today? Because if you will, I think you'll have joy. If you will, I'm positive, you'll laugh a whole lot more often than you are right now. Would you close your eyes? You know, salvation at its core is handing everything over to Him. As humans, we really love to try to handle everything on our own. We can be spiritual control freaks. But as we come to the end of the most trying year probably any of us have ever gone through, can we just acknowledge that it's time? It's time to hand everything over to Him. Maybe you've never done that. If you've never done that, we're gonna give you an opportunity to do that today. We're gonna to pray a prayer. And the Bible says, if you pray this prayer and you mean it in your heart, you'll be saved. Everything you've ever done wrong will be deleted. You'll get an opportunity to begin again. And so if you're watching this, I'm gonna pray a few lines in a prayer. And if you'll repeat those, and if you'll really mean them, you'll be saved. So will you say this? Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you come into my life? Will you make me different? Will you make me new? Will you be my Lord, be my Savior in Jesus' name? Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. My heart could not be filled with more joy. Welcome to the family. It's not gonna be easy at all times, but just know that you've got friends, you have brothers and sisters who are willing to walk this journey with you. And so if you could help us do that, just reach out to us, just message us, and let us know that you made this decision and we'll be sure to follow up with you. But we're not done. Maybe you're a Jesus guy or a Jesus girl. You're going to heaven, but you'd say, Sean, I'm, I'm carrying some stuff, especially this time of year. You'd say, Sean, I've got some things that I, I need to hand over. I need to let him carry because it's bogging me, burdening me down. If that's you, can I pray for you? God, for my friends who are watching this who are so burdened, they're weary. 2020's got them. God, we take those things and we hand them off to you. We can't carry them anymore. Our legs are tired, our hearts are tired, our spirits are tired. Would you take them in Jesus' name? Amen.